Recording in progress. But it's not your, your end all solution. Okay, it's, there's got to be more to it. Uh, over on the side here, on the uh, on your right side, uh, we've got a, a, a whole series of the ones that have made the newspapers, right? You've got the Colonial Pipeline down here. We got the Marriott one. You've all heard the Targets and the Home Depots. Everybody, especially if you live in North America, everybody dated, everybody's data here has been breached because of the entities that have been breached. Every single person's data has been taken, stolen. The question is, have they successfully used it yet or not, right? So the point of that is just saying it is really happening. These are the ones that make the papers. But for every one of these that make the papers, and they're so impressive, and they make the, you know, in a negative way, they make the newspapers and scares everybody to death. Is this, is this working? You guys hear me? Yeah. Um, for every one of these, there are literally thousands, thousands of small businesses that have been hit that never makes that paper. Small to mid-sized businesses that never makes a paper, and they are real from the from the impact that it's had. Okay. Okay. And they messed me up here. Let me see what I can do. There we go. Hopefully that makes this work. So what's happening? How are they doing this? What they're really doing is they're they're exploiting some form of weakness. It might be a weakness in uh, somebody that didn't respond properly to a verbal phone call um, that was doing voice solicitation where they try and use a phishing techniques or conning you into giving information. It might be a weakness in your emails or your processes or your functions in your organization. There's a lot, of, but it's almost always some type of explo exploitation. Okay. I got a couple of videos just to break this up so you don't just have to hear me yelling at you the whole day or uh, the, whole, the whole half hour here. But uh, I got a couple of videos to help illustrate some of these examples. What do you think of when I say the word hack? Some creepy dude in a basement? Well, that's a misconception. What if I told you there's a class of hackers who don't just have social skills, they have more social intelligence than anyone they'll ever be. David Kennedy is one of them. He's what's known as a social engineer or a people hacker. His craft is to dupe you into doing things and sharing information you probably shouldn't. Can I just keep your, this is your credit card number? Some use it for illegal activity. In David's case, companies pay him to find out if employees are leaving the company vulnerable. He and his team show us how it's done. Step one, spoof his number so it looks like he's calling from inside the company, and then call tech support. Hello, you there? Hello? Hi, it's Jennifer. I was wondering if I... Uh... You can uh, take a look at a website I'm trying to get to. It's for a gothic customer thing I'm working on for Monday, and uh, I can't seem to get to the website from my computer. Sure. Maybe it's how bored these two guys are. Thanks, man. Really watching the site. I mean, I watch this certain thing. I'm I'm fairly sub. So it's uh, it's 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 www.survey. That's uh, s u r v e y dash pro dot com. Here's what the IT guy doesn't realize. By clicking that link, he's just given David full access to his computer. Well, okay, that's great. I just said it works. It's good for me to find that. Awesome. I don't know what you did, man, but I really appreciate the help. That was it. Look at it now. They're totally excited. This guy's computer with it. I would say like under two minutes. Under two minutes. Yeah, under two minutes took over his entire computer. And think of it as not just this computer, but it's pretty much a town hall. In this case, the company was paying David to hack them to see if their employees would fall for it. They did. To show you this demo, we agreed not to use the company's name. Kennedy hacks to protect. He's part of a growing number of hackers using this skill for good. All right. So that's a combination of using technology as well as social engineering to take over that company. Remember, since it was an IT guy that they hacked, chances are, is they have access, they have keys to the kingdom, right? They can get pretty much anywhere because the IT department probably has access to just about everywhere. So that's a danger, and that's where they actually attack the IT people themselves. So again, we're exploiting something. This next one uses very little technology. In fact, the only technology they use really is spoofing of a phone number. Um, spoofing is where you make it look like you're calling from another number than you really are, which is actually really easy. You can look it up on the internet and do it in about 30 minutes. So um, this next one's a fun one. I uh, always get a kick out of people seeing this one. So let's enjoy it. Let's do it. Sure. You want to do a sample of the jingle? What's phishing? Phishing is voice solicitation. 
And basically, um, what we do is use the phone to extract information or data points that can be used in a later attack. Let's do it. And you, who are you going to call? Maybe I'll call your cell phone provider okay. and see if I can get them to give me your email address. I, I bet they're good. I bet they have my back. <laughs> but yeah, go, go for it. I'm going to spoof from your number, so it's going to look like it's calling from you. Okay. Hi, I'm actually, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me okay? I, my baby, I'm sorry. <laughs> my, my husband's like, we're about to fly for a loan and we just had a baby and he's like, get this done by today. So I'm so sorry, I can't I, um, call you back. <laughs> I'm gonna log into our account for uses information and I can't remember what email address we use to log the account. The baby's crying and, um, can, can you help me? Awesome. In just 30 seconds, Jessica gets my personal email address. Um, now, if I needed to um, add our daughter on our account so she could call in and make changes, how would I need to go about doing this? You would have to send me a secure pin through the text message. Yeah, well, the thing is, I don't think I'll be able to receive a text message if I'm on the phone. Oh, I'm not on there either. So I thought when we got married, um, he added me to the account. Jessica uses my girlfriend's name and a fake social security number. 5127. To set up her own personal access to my account. Wait, wait, so there's no password on my account right now. Can I set that up? She even gets the support person to change my password. Thanks so much for your help today. So she just basically blocked me out of my own account. I'll get her set up. <laughs> All right, thank you. Holy shit. So <laughs> they, they, just gave, they just gave you access to my entire cell phone account. You're going to have to go on and change your password right now. It's just <laughs> my name. And all it took was a crying baby and a phone call. Yeah. All right. So now it's fun to watch that and it's interesting, but I want you to ask yourself, the people you have in your office would think like that work, would something similar like that work? Is there a way that they could present themselves some sort of desperation. That's what it, it's usually what they're capitalizing on. They're capitalizing on some kind of urgency, some sort of false urgency, some kind of false distribute, uh, uh, emergency type situation, or, or what's the new young language, FOMO, fear of missing out, right? They're capitalizing on that kind of native desire in ourselves. Um, and you want to do your job, right? The employee's not a bad person. They're wanting to help their customer. It doesn't make them a bad person. But this is what I'm talking about. You have to focus on your policies and your processes and work to make sure that those are protected. It's not just IT. And that's what this session is about. This session is talking about what we can do as leaders in the organization, the managing levels part of the organization, what we can do to make that happen. Now, I didn't budget in my timeline for the big introduction in the beginning, so I've got to accept, accelerate this just a little bit, okay? Um, so let's get into what some of those specifics are. I've got a handful of examples. I can literally talk on this slide for probably two hours by itself, so we're not going to do that. But the major stages of a cybersecurity incident. Now, this is a little bit based on what the industry has defined and somewhat modified by me. Um, prevention and protection is a combined uh, stage. Uh, a lot of people in the industry try and separate those two. For the purposes of this presentation, in my client base, I tend to lump them together. Uh, prevention and protection, this is where you guys live. Right? This is your strength when it comes to working on protecting your organization. Okay? Um, detection and response and recovery. This, you still have a role, and we can get to some of these possibly, uh, but that's mostly after the events happen, and you're talking IT now. Your IT department is in charge, and you're just trying to support them. And you're trying to support them both with their tools that they need, as well as um, what your stakeholders need in terms of communication. So you become a communicator and a liaison at that point. And then review and notification, you're back in there and you're trying to figure out how this happened, what do we need to do, who do we need to notify, what kind of processes are there that need to be improved so it doesn't happen again. But one thing I'd like to do before I get into the prevention and protection, one thing I'd like to encourage everybody to understand is if you do everything perfectly on the front end, prepared and you've done all of this stuff and you've done everything we recommend and, and ultimately you get hit or your organization gets hit i want to assure you it will not be fun <laughs> it will not be a fun experience if my if my team and brett's team and everybody joins forces and we completely recover you it will still be miserable 
Okay, so how do we try and do it? The best defense is to stop it from happening if you can. That's why we want to focus heavily on prevention and protection. Okay, uh, make appropriate tech investments. I'm not going to spend any time on that. Basically, if your IT team should be recommending a nice layered defense system, I can't get into that right now in the details of what that is, and it's not really the purpose of this meeting. But you do need to make appropriate tech investments. Okay. User awareness and training. This is a critical one. Most of, in my world, which is small to mid-sized businesses, think you know, 750, 750 users and less. In my world, 90% of those attacks come in via email. All right, and who's getting your email, their email? Your users. You cannot exclude them from the process. You've got to create awareness and you've got to make it happen. And if you're relying on your IT team to do it, most offices, the users will not take it serious if management is not taking it seriously. So you've got to support your IT team to get them to do this. And I am coming up on the 20 minute mark. So that, that's way over my budget. So I'm going to say threat prevention re response reports. That means you're kind of communicating with your IT team, getting them to identify the threats, kind of a SWOT analysis. Cybersecurity insurance is, of course, the topic that's coming up behind me. So I won't need to cover that right now. Um, Special processes and procedures for our financial transactions. We're going to try and save at least 10 minutes to talk at the end of this thing. If you have questions about that, that's critical. There are so many attacks in the, for if you're dealing with direct deposits, payroll, things like that, uh, wire transfers. There are so many attacks aimed at those types of transactions. you got to come up with special processes that are on aimed not just at the traditional protection, but cybersecurity protection as well. Other than that, um, I'm going to have to take this through to the end because I'm out of time. I apologize. But I will be here afterwards for questions and answers. All right. And I can come back up. If we have 10, 15 minutes, I can bring the slide back up or we can stay afterwards. I apologize. Again, I didn't budget for the, the great opening there on the early stage. So. Just told me to shut up. <laughs> so, uh, what I'd like to really do is introduce Brett Harrington from Marsh McLennan. He's going to come talk to you about cybersecurity insurance, which again is a massive piece of the puzzle on cyber cybersecurity protection. Thank you for your time. Thanks for the support. If I can hear me? Let's do. Uh, you need that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So first things first, Matt, Adam, this is not an infomercial. I promise you, right? It's the only brand we'll see on here for sure. Uh, again, I'm Brett Harrington with Marshall Clinton Agency here in Houston. Um, I actually started my career back in 1998 in the insurance business. I was a field underwriter and producer for Zurich Direct Markets. I still remember the call that I got that changed my life and moved me to insurance. The guy's name was Wayne Nippers, and he said, Brett, I'm here to talk to you about a career in insurance, and I'll have a phone. Two hours later, he calls me back and said, don't hang up, don't hang up, I know your dad. And that's how I got in the insurance business, right? So I want to be an astronaut. Not in the insurance business. And yet I've found that managing risk, right, and protecting our clients' investment and legacy uh, has been about as much fun as I ever could have asked to have. What are we hearing from our clients, right? Number one, what security do I need to have in place in order to ensure that I'm covered for cyber risk at the optimal price? We'll talk about the optimal price in a minute, but uh, it's changed by the hour. We need a plan to protect our intellectual capital and our private customer data that now lives in the cyber world. That goes without saying. We also hear that our internal system houses all of our employees' personal data. I need a plan to protect this data to avoid identity theft and a loss of trust in our organization. Does that sound about like what you're trying to do on a daily basis? So the cyber risk is real. Again, as Stephen went through it, Better than now, 70% of the ransomware cases that we are seeing use data exfiltration as a part of uh, their tactics. That's up from about 50% in Q3 of 2020. It's known as double extortion. And what that means to you is that not only are they locking down your system, but they're also pulling data out of your system as well and holding it until you're willing to pay for it, right? Um, 234 at the time of this slide being uh, created, was the average employee size of the companies impacted. We're now seeing that average pushed up a little bit more at the 265, 270 range, but remember what, how you average things, right? No company's too small to be at risk. And as Stephen and I were talking before we started today, as a matter of fact, smaller companies may be now an even healthier and better target uh, because the likelihood of seeing a ransom paid 
uh, is better when it's twenty or thirty thousand dollars versus two and a half to three million and up. Right? Twenty-one days of average downtime. I seen this actually improve a little bit with legal and forensic support from Cyber Centers of Excellence. Um, but it's a good time probably for me to introduce the largest cyber insurance claim that I've ever experienced at this point in my career. And it happened um, the evening of January 8th of this year, which is Friday night. I better double checking on that calendar, but I think I'm correct on that. We got a call on Saturday morning, large client of mine, so we've also got customers, right? Um, had their entire system shut down overnight. So everybody closed, shop, left, came in on Saturday morning to open up, and there wasn't a single computer that was operational. Nothing, right? This is a franchise organization that's got locations in multiple states, and uh, the situation was not great. This is a Saturday morning that we're getting the call, right? It's not 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. This is the reality of what clients are dealing with right now. It's the reality of what you'll be dealing with when the event something like this takes place. And I'll get to where we, we ended up with this in just a second. No, it's not over yet. Purchasing patterns. Average cyber rate change through March 21st of this year was in the neighborhood of 40%. Okay, That's a lot. Even if your cyber insurance policy is only costing you 3500 seven grand, ten grand, right? It's still $10,000 that uh, you'd probably rather spend on something else. Um, I just showed Adam an email. The customer's name was was scrolled up and redacted, right? But in this particular renewal, the cyber has been a small part of their entire insurance package and the expiring premium is $17,000, $17,000 for this year. The renewal is $48,000, right? And the terms and conditions of the policy have changed. Now this is hot off the presses. I got this email 15 minutes ago, okay? And it's only getting worse. So what's the current market look like right now in Q4? I know everybody's happy to hear all of this wonderful news, right? But it's the reality of what you're gonna to have to deal with. Cyber threat actor activity has increased in frequency and severity. There's no doubt about that. Um, premium increases in excess of 150% from Q4 2020, right? Now that depends on your business, it depends on the limits that you're purchasing, it depends on a lot of different things but expect your premium for your business to increase this year when the time comes for renewal. There are minimum mandatory security requirements now that you're going to have to have in place in order for you to secure an insurance renewal, all right? As a matter of fact, the largest provider of cyber insurance in the United States uh, has issued a mandate that questions four, through 10 on their application have to be answered as true and in force or, or actively uh, uh, being utilized in order for you to secure a renewal. What does that mean to you? You gotta have multi-factor authentication in place. If you don't have MFA, you're not gonna get a renewal on your insurance policy, right? Um, I, can, I can go on and on from there. I'll actually read through the list at the end of the presentation if we have time. It's pretty straightforward, right? But it's also an expense for your business. Limits are available. Uh, but the renewal of the existing policy may come with changes in renewal terms and conditions. I had a large client in August that had a $5 million cyber insurance liability policy in place because a contract that they had with one of their providers required those limits to be enforced. The renewal would only deliver $1 million in coverage. And so it put them in a tough spot, right? Between what their contract uh, with one of their providers uh, required and what they had the ability to purchase. The insurers right now are dictating the terms and conditions for new policy purchasers as well, right? So they're telling you how to run your IT department, how to run your business, uh, for lack of a better way to put it, in order for you to be able to purchase this coverage. There are, however, some new partners on the scene that may be making things a little bit easier, right? For a number of years, you were purchasing this insurance or this type of insurance product from only a couple of different providers, but they lost a lot of money, right? The premiums are increasing, terms and conditions are changing, and the competition says maybe this is a good time for us to take a look at what we can do in the marketplace. Willingness to provide IT security overviews is something that's another bright spot, right? As you go through the application process, uh, many of the insurance providers are able to give you a report back on what they're seeing that may help you improve cybersecurity working with a firm like Stevens or your, your internal IT company, they can give you the ability to improve security. 
But in short, the market's chaotic and there's absolutely no end in sight. So what are we suggesting, right? Look for a partner in preparation and response. It's the best thing that you can do for yourself and your organization. A cyber seller of excellence team, and that's what we happen to call it, right? But it starts with, uh, in many cases, your insurance agent, your information technology provider, if you're subcontracting that out. Uh, it could be your internal ID department, right? But begin to develop a cyber center of excellence for your organization. So be contacting and uh, consulting with cyber liability experts. Work with your team to devise a plan of action that's going to be right for your organization. It's going to help to get you ahead of the game. This is what you're going to need to be prepared for if you want to purchase a product. And if you don't want to purchase an insurance product, you definitely need to be doing this type of thing to protect you from what's on the way. So number one, be sure everybody understands what's going on, right? Do you have a potential threat out there? I like to think that if you access the, the internet or you utilize emails, you've got the threat. You've got the potential, right, to run into problems from a bad actor. Then you want to be sure that you've got a plan put together to mitigate the exposure that you've got, right? An insurance program can help for sure because they can align uh, with existing policies that you've got in place to prevent um, uh, issues from taking place, and it can optimize your investment in dollars. Again, the products aren't cheap anymore, uh, and they're only getting more expensive. Then be sure that you understand what the process is going to look like to respond, right? What are the emerging risks that are out there? What in the world can we do to protect ourselves when everything that we do is online, up in the clouds? And then finally, understand that if you have a situation take place, what do you have to do to recover? How do you get back in business? Um, it's, a, it's something that where you think you've got everything planned and then when the event happens, I'll guarantee you, you didn't think of something, right? Uh, it's happened in my organization. And we use anything from multi-factor authentication, sorry about that, right? To get a text on a cell phone that has a line with something that you see on the computer screen in order to access something else, right? I am not the IT guru, in case you haven't figured that out, okay, right? But we've got a fantastic team that works with us to try and protect what's most important to us, the information that we have stored, right? Your information, our employees and colleagues' information, uh, and it's out there to be taken, and, and uh, you can be extorted for it. So, with all of this negativity, how in the world do you position favorably, especially when this particular component of the insurance market is hardening, right? This is how you would want to put together your business case to make you an ideal insured. Number one, be sure that you're prioritizing privacy and security. If that's not something that's uh, on top of your mind, uh, and you would think it would be with everyone, but as we go through the renewal process, which is pretty busy right now, right, for one one, we're going in and the teams are talking to our clients and we're finding out that no, they're really not thinking about it. Or they understood that they needed to have multi-factor authentication in place. Authentication, there I go again, in place. Uh, but just haven't done it yet, right? Because it's expensive, because we're not sure how it's going to work, because it may slow down our business, right? Uh, I can tell you it doesn't slow it down, but it's something that you have to be thinking about. Implementing guidance and analytics around preparedness. Right? How are we going to be prepared? How do we prevent these things from taking place? Amplify due diligence processes when engaging in business partnerships. So it's not just you, right? It's also the people that you do business with. How can those individual corporations negatively affect you in the event that a cyber event takes place and vice versa? Because you're kind of in this together if you're doing business electronically. Employ best practices to identify and implement network and system safeguards. And that's a, that's a manual, right? It's 100 pages. Um, establish employee outreach and training around cyber risk. How many of you are doing uh, anti-fishing training right now? Anybody? So that's also going to be something that you'll need in place in order to be able to renew this product, all right? Um, I have gotten so paranoid about emails coming in that aren't legitimate that IT finally said, Brad, if it's coming from us, you probably don't need to turn that as efficient, right? That's not, that's not what we're talking about. Um, but we, we randomly drop um, emails that look fairly legitimate into our colleagues' inbox and watch to see who catches it and gets it turned into information technology 
we call it MGTI, right? Versus who opens it. Or even worse, we have dummy downloads and you're able to track and see who actually goes as far as downloading something that they're not familiar with. And you'd be amazing what it, or it's amazing what you see, right? I'm amazed to see the report. And going, this is one of the smartest people in the building, and yet they downloaded that to the computer. That would crater us. And so this type of training is something that's going to be mandatory in order for you to be able to secure the insurance program, right? And certainly make it something that's reasonable to pay for. So what does good security look like? Steven's been through a lot of this already, right? So I will, I will continue to beat this up. But number one, ransomware identification. Do you have systems and processes in place right now that give your organization the ability to identify ransomware at, at the gate, right? So I'll drop back into the January 8th, 9th, and still ongoing uh, issue that, that's real time, okay? The ransomware was downloaded in another state, right, via web surfing, and they just happened to be at the wrong site. Now, this particular organization has controls in place to allow you, or supposedly to protect them, and to allow you to surf the internet safely. In this case, it didn't work, right? So the bot, am I using the right terms there? There you go. Right? So I didn't know any of this. Was downloaded onto that desktop, and it sat there for a couple of days. Then that individual sent an email, and the email got forwarded again, and it ended up in the servers. And what doing Good. Yeah. All right. And it sat there for a couple of days and it was keyed to go off leading into the weekend because that's the biggest impact, right? And they shut everything down and when they fired everything back up, there it was and everything went into lockdown. If they had had the ability to identify that at the gate, we could have isolated that segmentation component, right? That attack had been able to save them $487,000 in restoration expenses, right? I'll also add that the initial ransom request was $2.4 million. And they arrived at that number by the gun of Brass Street files. So when the forensics team went in and started to negotiate with the threat actor, the bad actor, they said, no, we know you have the money and we're not gonna release it until it's paid. Business continuity planning. This client thought they had everything figured out, everything under control. Guess what? Not even close. Not even close. Um, we didn't know what to do. And I say we, they didn't know what to do. It was call us, right? The good news is that there's a team that we have put together. And we'll get into that in just a second. And that it's not just my company. It's these carriers, right? They have teams to support you as a customer. Any phishing exercises, we've already been through that, right? Be sure that you're aware. Backups, how often are you backing up your systems? Um, probably not enough. Where is the data being sent? Can you access it in the event of a lockdown or ransomware case, right? Multi-factor authentication. Authentication, I don't know why I'm having trouble with that word today. I can't stress enough that you do not have MFA in place you're not going to be able to purchase an insurance product on a go forward basis. And if you don't have it in place and you're not purchasing insurance, I think it tells you just how important it is to protect your systems, right? To have that in place. Endpoints, EPP, EDR, LAPS, endpoint protection, right? Uh, endpoint data response, LAPS. You got me in All right, I've got my notes on the <laughs> just a second. Again, I'm not the technical guru, I promise. Um, email, web, and office document security, right? What does that security look like for you? How much thought have you put into it? If you're relying on your Outlook provider, right? That's probably not going to be enough. The next thing though that we learned through this particular large claim is that segmentation is the name of the game. How do you get infections blocked off where you can still operate? Or can you at all? If everything's so intertwined that you don't have the ability to segment and protect, uh, you're going to run into a serious problem in the event that you get attacked. Monitoring, patching, and vulnerability management policies, right? Um, be sure that uh, you're paying attention to how you patch, 
not only that, though, what's vulnerable in your system and how do you start to create a workaround? And then finally, mergers and acquisitions. I, I don't know about y'all, but I haven't seen as much MA activity as I've seen over the last few years in my entire life, right? We've got ideas around what's driving mergers and acquisitions, but I'm telling you, if you were thinking about selling your business, right, or are you about to be acquired, what you're doing from the way of cybersecurity is going to make a material difference in what that merger looks like as you go through the process. Cyber resiliency. Just really learning to understand what this even means. How many of you have Googled cyber resiliency before? What did you see? It's the, really the ability to, um, well, I saw a lot of things, but it's the ability to recover from an event. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, I call it the donuts, right? So if you Google this and you look for something that you can utilize to start to have a conversation with your teams, right, your colleagues, and employees, it's going to be a bunch of circles. And some have four different spaces and some have 12 different spaces, right? But what it's doing is helping you to direct how you're going to be able to continue to stay in business in the event that a cyber attack takes place. I'd encourage you to start to think about what that looks like, right? And then figure out where you need to go to get some guidance and assistance if that's not something that you have the ability to do internally. Um, it's not only about information security, right? But it's also the legal components of risk management. And when we talk about the legal components of risk management, um, it's not just the data that's taken, but it's who's going to sue you because you got you lost the data, right? It's who's going to sue you because you don't have the ability to deliver the product that you promised them you would deliver at a, sp a specific time, right? There's a lot that goes into how you set up uh, the ability to continue to operate in the case uh, or the event of a case like we're just describing, um, and you can't put enough money into it. Certain cyber resiliency networks offer proactive and complementary services to help prevent a cyber incident. Uh, and again, those can be provided by not only the insurance carriers, but agencies by, through contracted companies. There's a ton of it out there. All right. So I know we're still excited about insurance. This is the product that you're purchasing, okay? How many of you have a cyber insurance policy in force right now? Insurance product, okay, good, good. Not everybody, but a lot of folks, right? You may or may not need the product. I'm not the guy that's here to tell you, but I am here to tell you that I'm gonna offer it to every client 100% of the time. I see both my insurance compadres in here nodding their head, right? If you're not seeing this product offered, somebody's not doing their job. That is how important it is to put this in front of every customer. I don't care how small or large you happen to be. Somebody is spending every waking hour while you're probably asleep trying to stay ahead of you and figure out how to get the dollars from you. If you've got 10 employees and you make $3 million a year, they would love to shake you down for 30 grand and they figure they can do that in about 30 minutes, right? I'd like to make $30,000 every 30 minutes. That's what these folks have the ability to do. They also believe that the smaller you are, the more likely you are to pay the ransom. And the more likely it is that you don't have an insurance product in place, so they're only negotiating between you and the threat actor, you're going to lose. You're going to lose, right? What does an insurance product offer? Well, first of all, it's first party. It protects you. You're the first party, okay? Data breach response. Data restoration insurance, network business interruptions, security and privacy liability, cyber extortion, just a few of the first party uh, coverages that are part of this type of insurance product. Then you've got third party. Who do you harm and what do they want from you in return, right? Privacy liability, network security liability, the list goes on. And we'll, we'll have this uploaded, right, onto the portal as well. Uh, so uh, you'll have the ability to review it. The cyber exposure categories, if you got cyber insurance in place, and I saw a lot of hands, most of the hands go up, right? You really know what it's covering? Right? I don't, you might know for sure, right? But you need to be having this conversation and hit your representatives with a what if scenario. And if they're like me, most of the time I guess, I don't know. Let's get somebody on the phone, right? Because we want to be sure that we're doing the best job of protecting the most important part of my personal business, and that's you, the customer. So it's more than just cyber crime and cyber fraud, right? But it's now an increasingly more complex 
than just social engineering where somebody sends an email that says it's Susie Smith and would you mind wiring funds? And yet, this is what I'm amazed by. In this world of ransomware, in this world of cyber extortion, in the world of increasingly complex claims, people are still stepping back 10 years and falling for the simplest stuff. That's why I love the, the uh, video that you showed earlier, right? That's reality. I got an email first of the week, it was Friday, so I'm trying to remember what day it was, right? And they said, can you give me some help? And it was all around uh, something that I would have expected you would know by now not to do. It was something you'd expect to see 10 years ago. But they fell for it, crowded funds. Now we got a problem. Uh, physical asset damage, um, it, we had to replace computers, right? In the event of a loss that I'm, I described to you. Impact of reputation, guess what? You got a notification requirement. And that's not a pretty place to be if your brand depends on excellence. So what I do in the event of a breach, you go back to finishing up the claims example, and again, I'm like, Steve, I can talk about this for five hours, right? And I don't have the time to do it. But we minimized exposure and we maximized the backup, which gave us the ability to have a pretty strong starting point in the process. And we tapped into insurance expertise. They called me because they had the product. And I said, I don't know. It's Saturday, but we'll find out. Luckily for me, the carrier in this particular claim had a cyber forensics response team that, that was on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That doesn't make me unique, right, for my agency. Adam's got access to that. Matt's got access to that. Your agent has access to that, right? Um, we were able to get this jump team in place and have them start the process of recovery that weekend. And they literally work 24 hours a day in shifts to get through this process. We had this client back up in an operation in eight days and limping through the process in about three working days, right? And they believed that they lost in excess of a, half, a million and a half dollars in business income over those days, right? Significant. Follow your internal and external guidance. This client made a decision to utilize their contracted IT team rather than to use one of the forensic teams that were available to them. Give you some advice, right, for the cent and a half that it's worth. If your insurance carrier for an insured loss tells you that they have a team that will handle everything, take them up on it, right? Because the restoration expenses of $478,000, right, are only being reimbursed to the team of about 260. And the issue with that is that what's an upgrade and improvement? And what was necessary in order to get you back in business? Now, I don't know about you, but a $210,000 deductible is an awful lot of money to me, right? And it could have been saved if we utilized the team that was there instead of the IT subcontractor. But that's a decision that you're going to have to make. There's a lot of trust involved there, right? And the insured understood the risk. Execute on the ransom payment or don't, right? You think you'd pay? Right? This customer said, hell no, excuse my language, that's a quote, hell no, I'm not paying these guys, not two point whatever it was, million dollars. Through the negotiation process, they did something, uh, it's like proof of life, I'm trying to remember what that term is exactly, but they proved exfiltration, they proved that they had taken data and were holding it, right? And they send you back bits and pieces and you go through all the paper files and you found out, uh oh, they got everything. They've got everything. Well, maybe I need to pay it after all. Yeah, maybe you do, right? And so in this particular case, the final negotiated settlement was just north of $175,000. And that's a far cry from $2.3 million, right? That's how good these teams can be. But it's still significant. And without somebody fighting for you on your side, you're on your own and negotiate with somebody that probably doesn't even speak your language. That's something that you gotta wrap your head around, right? because the threat's not just coming from next door. As you saw in the uh, opening slide, it's global. It is global. But here's what I guarantee you. It is not the time when you get attacked to learn how to manage a ransom payment, to understand cyber, uh, to understand cryptocurrency, right? Only Cyber Center of Excellence preparation will have you ready to respond. I'm running out of time here and I apologize. Again, I said I could talk about this all day, but I know you guys are all happy that I'm on the timer, right? Why don't you use the CCE 
They offer insurance solutions. They offer analytics. It's a partnership between you and uh, the carrier and your agent and the educational services that are available to you as well. And they are the best line of defense. So with that, I am thankful to have an opportunity to spend some time with you today. I hope you found it informative. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. Awesome, thank you.